Good morning everyone and welcome to another out and about video and today we're going to visit the grave of a poor lad whose body was discovered after a 10 year search he went missing in 1984 um, and it was during the redevelopments of Ewood Park or the home of Blackburn Rovers Football Club that a sinister and sad discovery would be made When Blackburn Rovers lifted the Premier League title in 1994, it was the accumulation of five years investment by a man known as Jack Walker. And Jack Walker was a successful businessman in and around the Blackburn area, he was a local lad as well. But he invested a lot of his own money into Blackburn Rovers Football Club. And like I said, it took a five year plan, if you will, from the moment he took over, he brought in Kenny Daglish as manager, they paid a record fee for the likes of Alan Shearer, and they went on to lift the title in dramatic circumstances, like I said, in 1994. But plans were already afoot to try to redevelop the stadium, Ewood Park. And what they did, they put in a, a plan. I think it was three stands that they were renovating and improving. And that was to stay in line with the Premier League so-called big boys at the time. And Jack Walker knew that he had the nucleus of great things at Ewood Park. So like I said, he invested a lot of his own money and in 1994, they lifted the Premier League title. But it was the year before that, whilst developing or redeveloping the Jack Walker stand, as it is now known, a grim discovery would be found. And that would be the remains of a victim or a body. They didn't know if it was a boy or a girl, a man or a woman at the time, but they found the remains in the grave of number 84 Nuttall Street and Nuttall Street itself had been demolished the year before but it's when they were digging a trench I think it was a 30 inch deep trench a skull appeared from where the digger was actually removing the debris so obviously at the time everything had to be stopped the police were involved detectives came down the cordon the entire area off now what they discovered that morning or that afternoon close to dinner time it would be the remains of a boy who'd been missing for 10 years and that boy was Julian Brookfield so it's around July the 19th 1994 when a workman by the name of John Griffiths he was the guy who was digging the trench where Nuttall Street formerly was um, and this is when the discovery of Julian's remains will be found and like I said the police were quickly involved um, They came down the cordon the area off they had to take forensic um, Examinations of the area, you know like you would expect them to and I think it was four days later when The victims remains would be formally identified of those of being Julian and I think it was a former friend who had seen newspaper resorts at the time um, but he didn't really take much notice of it until he, um, he was sat down at home watching TV and then he saw something on the telly, the news article um, and it brought back memories of his friend who went missing, like I said, in 1984, 10 years before 
um, and obviously his friend was that of Julian so he involved the police, he informed the police you should say and um, they did DNA analysis and things like that and eventually obviously it would the remains would be identified as being those of poor Julian Brookfield so when the obviously the press got wind of what was going on you know that um, a body had been found in the former grounds of Nuttall Street a spokesman told reporters that the body may have been there for about 15 years or so which probably would be correct at the time because we know Julian went missing like I said around about 1983-84 um, the body itself the description was of a male aged between 15 and 25 roughly 5 foot 10 inch tall he had a full head of fair hair but he was also dressed in jeans and a red and green vertical lined striped shirt which was a Ben Sherman shirt as well apparently um, the torso was wrapped in a plastic sheet and it was dumped inside a water pipe with its head removed we don't know if the head was removed by accident obviously when the diggers were digging but yeah it would have been a grim discovery for for anybody So we've actually found Julian's final resting place. And for those interested, if they want to come down and obviously pay their respects, his headstone number is J27. And uh, we'll show directions how to get here uh, when we make our way back to the car. But if you look at the headstone, you'll see his name, Julian H. Brookfield, 1965 to 1984. And there's obviously other family members here, Catherine Mul. Kehe, I think it is, or Gone. And then you've got sister of Ellen Carey. You've got Robert Brookfield. I presume that maybe his his dad, his father. 1936 to 1976. And then you've got a more recent one, which is sad. Adrian Brookfield, a dear son. 20th of February 1967 to 16th of November 2020. So yes, yeah, so this is obviously the final resting place of poor Julian in a case that you could say rocked Blackburn but more definitely the family Annette who was the mother even though she said she was pleased for the the jury's verdict at the end it still wouldn't uh, obviously bring her son back um, and I think to uh, to know that Brian Blakemore himself he had his sentence reduced just 12 months later and you know that must have hurt even more but yeah this is the final resting place of Julian Brookfield now the police obviously had this this victim the remains of this body but they didn't have any idea as to who he was until obviously he was identified by his friend Anthony um, but there was no more what's the motive you know why was this body here had he been a murder victim had he you know been killed in some form of accident it's, it was hard for the police to understand but it was only take a few hours i think it was before a name came up and that was the name of brian blakemore now brian blakemore was a bit of a known personality in and around blackburn and accrington and i think by all accounts he helped pen the song to the accrington stanley football club's centenary anthem um, and he got a bit of a reputation for writing jokes and he sent them off to the cabaret circuits I think it was Norman Wisdom or Norman Collier um, Keith Harris people like that who he sent you know obviously these jokes too so he, he had a bit of a reputation it was a family man it was, he'd been married to Hillary for around about 29 to 30 years he had I think three children um, but he also owned number 84 Nuttall Street where obviously this torso had been found 
Now, Brian himself, he had suffered from, I'd say, ill health. Um, he was involved in a car accident when he used to work for a taxi firm. I think it was Super B's, something like that. I'll put it down below. But he worked for a taxi company, but he was involved in a bad accident, which left him, I think, with a metal pin put in his ankle, so he walked with a limp. He suffered from arthritis. I think he was blind in his left eye. Um, so he had all these ailments. But, uh, yeah, um, Brian Blakemore's name came up as a prime suspect. Now, I think it was round about, was it July the 23rd, something like that, when after something like eight hours um, of interviews, several hundred pages of handwritten notes by the police, about 700 pages, um, he would actually be formally charged with the death and the concealment of Julian Brookfield's body. On Monday, 25th of July, 1994, Blakemore appeared before the Blackburn magistrates charged with the murder of Julian Brookfield and the Accrington Observer would be the very first local newspaper to show a picture of the accused man. However, the trial of Blakemore wouldn't take place until April 1996, almost 18 months after the discovery of Julian's body. At Preston Crown Court, Blakemore denied charges of murdering Julian, perverting the course of justice and obstructing the coroner. Mr Richard Henriques QC told the jury that the link between the two men was that Julian had worked in a sex shop in Accrington where Blakemore was a customer, but the motive for murder was not known. He would also reveal that Julian's body had been unearthed during building work on a new stand in 1994 and that the body had been wrapped in two sheets of plastic and buried in a 32 inch deep trench. However, decomposition meant that a pathologist could not determine a cause of death. So after the police had charged Brian Blakemore with possible murder and the concealment of Julian's body, they had to then dig deep into knowing who had rented out number 84 Nuttall Street over the years. Because obviously you can't just point it down to Brian himself being possibly the murderer. They had to cover all the tracks. And I think they did this before they charged um, Brian. But uh, one woman came forward and it's, this is all coming out in court later. And she said that Brian had told her not to do any developments of the garden without his say so, which you could find quite condemning um, because did he know that obviously this body was there? We'll get to this bit shortly because, like you said, there's going to be some parts of this story which you may question if Brian was actually culpable of murder and concealment of Julian's body. But yeah, he did tell one person not to do or undertake any work in. The garden which you know is quite peculiar now as for Brian Blakemore apparently and these are the only words that I'm going to use and phrases I'm used that we've read in the papers and we've looked into but from all accounts Brian he had a bit of a a bit of a darker side to him in that he was into bondage he was into pornography um, I mean that in itself isn't anything new, a lot of people are still into things like this but I suppose back in the 90s, especially when they found a torso of a, of a body that's been buried the police were kind of, you know, edged towards that Brian had more to, to say than, than what met the eye but he used to uh, pay for, for agency workers to come up from Manchester and he'd pay them so he could take photos of women in bondage gear, in bondage situations um, he used to send off a sex catalogues in Nelson, a sex shop from Nelson. But what has all this got to do with Julian? Now apparently, Julian did get a job working in a sex shop and this is how the police seem to think he encountered Brian Blakemore for obviously the first time. But then you ask the question, but what has Julian's death got to do with Brian? Now when it went to court, all that the actual prosecutors could come out with was that something had gone wrong at number 84 Nuttall Street and Brian, for whatever reason, has ended up killing Julian and trying to dispose of his body. But as Brian's family reiterated, there's absolutely no proof that her father had committed the murder. There was actually no proof that Brian was involved in any way, shape or form. There was nothing to suggest that Brian Blakemore had indeed committed murder and dumped the body other than the fact that obviously he knew Julian from his time working in the sex shop 
Now, the interesting thing about this story is that Julian, I think he was either 17, 17 years old or 19 years old at the time of his death, and his mother, Annette, she put appeals out for his whereabouts because he went missing around about 83, 1983. And he was last seen, I think, went to a, a doctor's surgery. But uh, yeah, for 10 years, she searched high and low um, for any known whereabouts of, of her son. And apparently Julian was a well-liked boy. You know, he, um, he got on with a lot of people. He, he was a, a chirpy, fun kind of character. Um, and apparently Julian took the job on at, at, the sex, at the sex shop because he thought it'd just be a bit of fun at the end of the day. You know, and obviously, if Brian Blakemore is into all these fetishes, or he was into these fetishes and, you know, pornography and whatnot, and like I said, a lot of people are, doesn't mean the murderers. Um, you've got to question why would Brian take the life of Julian? And like I said, the prosecutor seems to think it might have been a sex game that went wrong and Julian had ended up dying somehow. Brian may have panicked and tried to dispose of the body. But what makes this case kind of stand out, and like I said, I can only go off what the newspaper articles have, have written, and that is his own family. You know, everybody said at the time, his, his own defence team said that he, he basically there was nothing, there was no proof. He might have owned 84 Nuttall Street, but it doesn't actually make him a murderer. He might have been into pornography, soft porn, bondage, things like that. Doesn't make him a murderer. But this is, these are the facts that the prosecution seem to base their case on. Now I'm not trying to defend Brian and say personally I think he was innocent because I don't, I don't want to go down that road. At the end of the day we've got a story of a young boy, Julian Brookfield, who, like I said, he was a happy-go-lucky happy character. You know, he didn't do anybody any harm, never offended anybody, and yet this poor lad has lost his life and obviously he never got the proper funeral, he never got the proper arrangements that anybody should have. Um, you know, instead he was crudely wrapped up in a plastic sheet and dumped in a waste pipe. Now, the thing is, if it wasn't for Blackburn Rovers putting plans in place to redevelop their stadium, their ground, then Julian, he would probably still be there to this day, hidden away, um, and he could have been there for all time. And I know at the time when Rovers were talking about redeveloping the ground, there was a lot of up, a lot of uproar. Really. All the locals were panicking about the, the the houses that they were living in, what would happen to them. There was protests put in place. So in some way, some good did come out of what Jack Walker was doing in the redevelopments of Ewood Park. Uh, you know, like I said, it closed the case, it closed the book on poor Julian and his mother's ten years search for him. I mean, but nevertheless, it still won't bring Julian back. Uh, and it is such a tragic case. Now, I think it was, well, within days of Brian Blakemore being found guilty of murder. And I think he got eight years for murder and another, sorry, was it seven years for murder and another five years for concealment of the body? In total, they got 12 years anyway. But um, his family put an appeal in straight away. And I think it was July the following year when that appeal was successful. And I think he ended up serving something like five years, that's all, uh, sorry, eight years in total for obviously the murder and concealment of Julian's body. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a tragic case and I suppose that appeal wouldn't have gone down too well with the Brookfield family and quite rightly because if Brian was indeed guilty of this crime, then obviously, you know, an eye for an eye and all that kind of stuff, I guess. You know, as a parent myself, I'd want proper, um, I don't know, a proper judgment of the case, if you will. But um, I've also got to sit on the fence with it and think, supposing Brian didn't do the murder. I mean, he always said he was innocent, he had nothing to do with it. But like I said, I wasn't in court, I wasn't in any of the services. I, you know, obviously it's hard for me or anybody else to say if, if Brian Blakemore indeed was capable of murder or was indeed the murderer. Um, but yeah, it's such a tragic case. It really is. Um, Brian Blakemore himself, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound insensitive at all with anybody in this story. He could well still be alive today. I don't know. Um, he's obviously got family, children, themselves who are probably still around. They might be still locally. 
Um, but yeah, really is a tragic case and one that brings home that obviously when a loved one goes missing, you'll do anything to try to find them. Um, and obviously, if you haven't got full closure on that, such as Annette, they haven't got closure, I don't think, personally, on this one. Um, there's always doubt going to be there. But yeah, um, sad. When it came to the actual court proceedings, um, Brian would actually tell the jury in court that <clears throat> he admitted to taking these photographs of women in bondage situations, you know. It, it, it was his thing. Um, and apparently it, it, he used to take these photographs to pay his way in life, you know, because he'd sell these pictures, I presume to magazines or whatever. Uh, but that was his, that was his, his reasoning. He'd, he'd, he'd pay money to, back to hire these girls for photographs which even though they weren't extreme they were still seen at the time to be a bit shady but yeah um, it apparently got into all this just so he could pay his way in life um, but his wife found out Hillary found out so he told the court and the jury that as soon as his wife found out she wasn't happy with it he stopped doing it um, it wasn't something that he kept on doing behind the back or anything like that he literally stopped there and then taking these photographs but yeah it seemed to me that the the old prosecution based everything on Brian just simply because he had this fetish or if that's what you want to call it when it came to pornography, soft porn. But well, it might not have been a fetish if he was doing it to make ends meet. Well that, that this is what I'm saying you know like like Vicky just said you know people do things don't they to to, to make money you know to, to like pay the way in life and because of Brian's actual injuries he probably was struggling for work he probably couldn't get the type of jobs that he used to could get you know like I said he was walking with a, a severe limp he was blind in one eye he had arthritis so it probably he was limited to what he could do so yeah I can quite understand why obviously he were doing these extra jobs these extra things to try and raise money but it just didn't go down too well obviously with the prosecution and everybody else because Julian worked in a sex shop because it was a sex shop and obviously Brian was into pornography. I think they've put two and two together and obviously Brian is obviously the murderer, he's the person who's concealed Julian's body. But like I said, I don't want to go down that road because I wasn't in court, I wasn't I wasn't there. Um it's up to you, the viewer, to decide on, you know, if Brian himself was guilty of such a crime and concealment of Julian's body. Um I mean this video at the end of the day is about visiting poor Julian and visiting his final resting place, paying all respects, which we've done. Um, but also obviously touching upon how he died and how his body was found. So where we're walking now was the farm in Nuttall Street where a row of houses used to be situated just down here opposite these ones and it was at number 84 where workmen would discover like I said the torso of a body um, that had been buried and dumped inside a drain pipe the drain pipe itself was about 30 32 inches down and the body was wrapped in plastic now obviously at the time they didn't have a clue if it was male or female but uh, the police were soon down here they swamped the place they closed all the area off 
Japan, like I said, they would release statements, they would release a, a description of the actual victim himself, or I should say, of itself. And uh, it was a quite a, a disturbing situation, because the last thing on the workmen's minds that morning would have been digging up and finding of a torso. Yeah, so I think it was towards the end of the Jack Walker stand, which obviously is over here, was where 84 was. Um, like I said, without looking at the maps, top of my head, I'm not exactly sure which area it would be in. But yeah, through these fences, these rails, 84 would have been somewhere around here, I think. So we can get a better view. But to think that, if obviously the workmen hadn't have been uh, excavating and redeveloping all of this as part of the redevelopment phase of Ewa Park, Julian would still be here today, underground, and that's what makes it even more sadder. So as we end this video, um, I did come across a newspaper article from the Lancashire Telegraph and it's from Julian's mother herself basically sticking up for a son which any parent would do and it's quite poignant, not only just for Julian but for what we do here on the Days of Horror channel and I'm going to read it out to you and I think you guys will understand but it goes on to say whether the victim is a child killed by a drunken driver an old person dying as a result of a mugging or an intended victim of a violent death they can bear no witness they have no defence no voice they cannot tell their story they cannot speak the truth nor can they lie they have all received a death sentence and they have no voice no finger to point they have nothing at all. They are the victims, the dead. So that's it from Ewood Park, where we're going to end this story. Normally we would, we would start the story from here and go to the cemetery, but in this occasion we thought we'd do it the opposite way around. But if you did like this story, or if, like I said, if you know this story, if you've heard of this story, comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are. Like I said, I'm not going to point the finger at Brian Blakemore, um, and I do really feel sorry for the family of Julian. Um, but like I said, I, I've said it quite a few times in this video, I wasn't, you know, participating in the jury, I wasn't at the trials. We're just telling the story of Julian, trying to remember him best way we can. Um, if you visit our website, www.daysofhorror.com, you can read a lot more on this tragic tale. There's a lot more information. Um, I've wrote about many of the letters that I went to and from the Lancashire Telegraph, like I said, one from Brian's family, I think it was his daughter called Heidi, like the, the message I've just read out there from Annette, the mother of Julian, so visit our website www.daysofhorror.com for more information on this tragic tale but if you did like this story you did like this content, as tragic as it is don't forget to give us a big thumbs up don't forget to comment down below and obviously subscribe to the channel because we do have a lot more videos coming on a regular basis but in the meantime, here from Ewell Park, take care, look after yourselves and we'll be back soon with another tale from our dark but illustrious past.